Hi, my name is Matt Shook. I'm the lead Michigan writer at PlayMichigan.com. Today I'm joined by my colleague Kevin Shelley of PlayPA.com, and we're going to be interviewing Rick Calm, the executive director of the Michigan Gaming Control Board with a focus on illegal gaming machines. Michigan's been a little bit of a success story in terms of the industry and how the enforcement has gone, and Rick Calm joining us today. Rick, can you give us a quick rundown of the scope of the illegal gaming machines problem in Michigan and how you kind of collaborated with some other agencies to combat it over time? Well, it's been going on for quite some time. Uh, the, there were uh, what was known as internet cafes, uh, where people were sell saying they're selling internet time, uh, where people were actually engaging in um, slot machine type gameplay uh, for a fee. And we also had some uh, redemption games uh, in, in fraternal halls and in convenience stores that were paying off in cash uh, were determined to be illegal. So we did a survey. Uh, we used um, liquor and lottery, their enforcement people, who go out in the field across the state and deal with liquor license issues and lottery terminals and asked them if they could just observe and see if the types of machines that we were concerned with were located. I think I sent you a map. Matt, I don't know if it came out okay. And we determined uh, in the spot map uh, where we believed that machines that were questionable were located. We also had complaints from some of the tribe, tribal governments that operated casinos outstate and our commercial casinos that they had seen uh, machines in multiple locations uh, that appeared to be illegal slot type machines. And your background is, is law enforcement. You've been the executive director of the Michigan Gaming Control Board for 14 years. But before that, you were with the Macomb County Sheriff's Office. How much did that help in putting together systems and the, the group effort that it took to have some of the success you had with illegal gaming machines? Well, that did help, right? My background was in law enforcement, and, and, and it was in southeastern Michigan. Uh, we bordered the city of Detroit, so it was a big metropolitan area. And... Um, when we received complaints and then we did a survey to see how big and widespread the problem was, it became apparent that there was no one jurisdiction, no one area where these machines were operating. And there was also, it was apparent that local law enforcement didn't have the knowledge or expertise to deal with them. They had, they had bigger priorities. And so local prosecutors weren't versed in the gaming laws that were available. And cities, um, townships who gave vending licenses, many of these places had like vendors, vending licenses, uh, that were really kind of misplaced. These weren't vending machines in any, in any fashion. Uh, so some of these places thought they were legitimately licensed. And so there was this organized subgroup that, that was, um, you know, proliferating these machines across the state. And until we had complaints and looked at the scope of it, it was then that we really kind of took action. And I guess my background in law enforcement came into play is because I belong to multiple uh, organizations, the FBI National Academy Associates, uh, the local chiefs, organizations, and then we started talking to local law enforcement to see if they had seen them, uh, whether they were aware of them, and then we did some seminars with local law enforcement at chief's meetings and at some of the meetings we had where we brought in the attorney general, explained the law, showed them pictures of what these machines look like, and had them be on the lookout for it. So it was more of a complete concerted effort. And then it made sense to us that if we were, as a state government agency, uh, could, we could utilize other state government agencies that were licensing uh, legitimate businesses for either liquor or for lottery terminals to at least look into this. And so, um, and, and so liquor was, was, and lottery both were very cooperative in that regard. In fact, liquor has written violations, liquor violations for having the presence of these machines. Uh, and then we also did some things where we played the machines to make sure they were illegal and built a criminal case uh, against uh, some of these individuals. So, um, liquor and lottery says you want to have a liquor license, you want to have a lottery terminal, you can't have illegal machines, um, and it's going to count against your license. So that impact uh, helped out immensely also. Was enforcement always centralized as it seems to be now, uh, or was that something that you brought in when you took over? I don't know if there was any enforcement uh, prior to us taking a look at it in, in the way we did. Um, because people didn't know whether they were legal or not. Remember, Michigan is a very robust gaming state anyways, 24 casinos and horse racing, things like that. So the public at large really didn't care one way or the other. Where it became an issue is when the legitimate gaming companies, like the three commercial casinos, 
and the travel casinos went, hey, what's going on here? This is, this should, is illegal. And then we had, uh, I had in my previous life done some investigations involving organized crime where vending machines and um, these types of machines were being utilized and skimmed by some organized crime people. So I knew that there was a whole undercurrent of organized crime that, that was involved in some, if not all, of these machines. And then we also looked at the software. We seized several of these machines. We had them, we, our lab looked at them and we sent them out to private labs. And we looked at the software, how the software was configured and how so easily it can change to become a payoff illegal machine. It was very hard to detect. Uh, and so then uh, we found out that some of the software was being distributed by certain persons in another state. So we did do some, we did make some effort to try and um, attach to those people. We weren't highly successful because of the way these are distributed and shared uh, and, and getting indictments against those people, but we were made aware of it. And, and, uh, and so really there's another industry that's grown out of this. Now there's a whole group of defense attorneys that have lined up to help <laughs> have these machines. <laughs> we're currently in the court of appeals being sued that we shouldn't be enforcing criminal law against these machines because they think they're illegal and I think that's going to fail. I think the court's going to say the attorney general can enforce the laws as he or she sees fit on their interpretation. Uh, so we kind of comically watch that thing progress. But so uh, people are concerned. Um, have we been completely successful? Oh gosh, no. I mean, we're just, we're still just scratching the surface, but we've got everybody's attention. And one of the reasons we do have their attention is in the Gaming Control and Regulatory Act in Michigan, Violation of the act, allowing gambling without a license, is a 10-year felony. Having mm. these machines it may only be a misdemeanor, a nuisance under a nuisance clause. That 10-year felony gets people's attention. And so we charged a few people with that 10-year felony, and they've, we've convicted people on that felony for having these machines. So we've really gotten the attention of the illegal operators that we're serious about. It. That sounds like it has a lot of teeth. And that's been one of the problems here in Pennsylvania, are you uh, up to speed on the the regulatory atmosphere here in Pennsylvania, or should I recap it slightly? Well, you're gonna have to recap it because I'm not. I, I mean, I know Kevin O'Toole over at the gaming board there, and I know that you guys have a lot of types of gaming machines allowed in multiple places where we don't. Ours is centralized to our 15 licensed operators that's who should be doing the gambling machines and so it's a little easier for us probably to get a handle on it probably um it, there's probably about twenty four thousand casino slots and vgts that are licensed and uh completely overseen by our control board but the other machines that are out there are kind of like no man's land uh, machines. No one's really looking at them much. The state police had been via their liquor control uh, function. They were uh, busting small places with liquor licenses that had machines, but that's dropped off dramatically. Um, a Last June, the state attorney general basically said he wasn't going to enforce lo the law against illegal machines because there was such a gray area. We have a thing called a Pennsylvania skills machine here in Pennsylvania. Um, I imagine you have skill machines of some sort in Michigan, but the PA skills machine itself was uh, subject of a uh, Superior Court decision that basically said there is an element of skill involved and that opened a door that everybody walked through. Um, so a ton of machines that aren't Pennsylvania skill machines but are marketed as skill machines flooded into the market. Uh, the Attorney General uh, said he's basically waiting for clarification from either the courts or the legislature before expending a lot of energy on forcing these. Um, the upshot is, and this comes from a spokesperson for Pennsylvania Skills, he thinks the proliferation of machines that we've seen in the last year are exactly because the AG uh, isn't enforcing and the confusion over what's legal and what's not legal in Pennsylvania 
Um, the district attorney in Delaware County, which uh, is southwest of Philadelphia, so probably similar to the county where you uh, are grounded uh, in terms of size and population and whatnot. He estimates in his one county of 500,000 people that there are 20,000 illegal machines. Uh, they can't get a handle on it. And he's made arrests and seizures. Uh, other DAs have made arrest and seizures, but it's it's kind of on an individual higgledy-piggledy basis right now. Do you have any suggestions for how Pennsylvania could get its act together given where things seem to stand in Pennsylvania at the moment? You know, I, I don't know, uh, based on what you're saying, it sounds like that there's, there's a lot of confusion on what's illegal and what's not until that confusion is cleared up. DAs, or as a rule, don't want to go down that path and then lose cases. And remember right. the priority, we're dealing with, um, for the most part, other than the crime that surrounds these machines, kind of a victimless, a victimless crime. Now, our enforcement, our attack on this might seem central, but the prosecution really isn't. Uh, we have the ability and we have cooperation with our attorney general, but we, have, we first defer to local law enforcement. We'll hand the file to them and say, this is illegal. Um, or to local prosecutors. And we've been successful with some local prosecutors taking it and local law enforcement handling it. Um, sometimes the local law enforcement, because they've been educated either by the things we've done in the education side of it or by our investigators going there and going, here's what we got, here's what we know is going on, um, they kind of run with it. Um, and, and then we assist them in doing that. So, uh, but all in all, it, it still comes down to some successful prosecutions, which, which other DAs look at or other county prosecutors look at and go, okay, I guess there is something here we can sink our teeth into. And then you get pleas, you know, then the pleas will start pleading guilty. Uh, we seize machines, you know, we're over thousands of machines that we seized uh, over time. And so we're sort of keeping the lid on it. Now we're very small, right? So um, the local law enforcement has to be the force multiplier. And in this time, day and time, it is still difficult to have them be the priority. What we have seen happen is we're now getting inquiries, a lot of them, from local law enforcement going, I remember seeing something about this. I wonder if this is legal. My officer was just in there. They got five machines. People are sitting around playing. They sure are like slot machines to me. And we get calls from them with pictures saying, hey, are these legal or illegal? If we can determine they're illegal or say they look highly suspect that they are illegal, then they'll take it, they'll take it to the next level. We either you know, notify their local government or whatever. One of the things we did do to clear up this gray area is we initially prosecuted several people under the Gaming Control Regulatory Act. And then the, the um, it, we weren't, we weren't even getting close to getting the, all of them that were out there, right? We couldn't attack the number of them. So we decided to create a form letter, a cease and desist letter um, by the Attorney General's office that when we identify it, we play the game, see it's illegal, we give them an opportunity to stop. And so um, when the judge, when we did have to finally prosecute somebody, the judge sees that we sent them a cease and desist on this date, we gave them 30 days to quit, they blew us off, we went in and seized the machines, arrested people, it changes the whole tone for the court. The court goes, hey, they told you, they warned you, and now they're bringing criminal charges, nice try, I mean, they, you know, they played their cards, hands out to you, and you, 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 know, you continue with the illegal behavior. So that's gotten us pleased. In other words, the judge has already said, look, you already had a chance. This is the case they laid out. We don't go to trial a lot on those people unless they're multiple offenders. So that's the approach we decided to take after initially attacking this thing with our guns out. We backed it off and said, let's start sending cease and desist. And that's gotten, it's solved a lot of the problem, right? 50 or 60, 70% of them disclosed. Now they might move 100 yards down the road, but they closed. We disrupted their operation. And the ones that we come back to, we've already got a case built. They open the door, we go in there and play one more time, and we bust them, and it really locks the case down. That makes absolute sense. Um, has anyone from Pennsylvania reached out to your agency in the last six months that you can think of? Not in regards to this, no. No, I do have meetings um, a bi -year, every six months or so with Kevin O'Toole and, and New Jersey's director and Nevada's chairman, 
uh, and we talk about a whole host of issues, but not that I recall they reached out on this, but we've had some crime associated with these also, right? Because these are criminal acts as, as a rule. And also with our charity gaming, uh, initially we had some crime associated with that. Um, so um, we've had some media attention to it in, locally here, but, but really we haven't um, been contacted by other agencies. That's interesting to me uh, because again, it just seems like PA has thrown up its hands. Um, the Gaming Control Board gives uh, grants to local law enforcement agencies. That's about as far as they go. They did affirmatively declare any machine basically that's not in a casino as an illegal machine. There's right. just no way that you can drive a uh, through the little tiny narrow hole that's created by the Pennsylvania skills machine decision, but people are. No one's jumped on that though very much. What do you think it would take for Pennsylvania to um, get closer to your model? What would they need to um, enact? What would they need to reorganize about how they approach this? Well, really what we preferred and what we've been trying to do is get the legislature to make it easier um, that we would have to approve any machines that are located in any of the licensed establishments. In other words, it should have a sticker on it from the Michigan Gaming Control Board. Well, between the three of us, nothing there is going to get a sticker from the Michigan Gaming Control Board. What that does is that allows the city, the police, uh, the Liquor Control Commission, the, the um, lottery people, to look at it right away and see that prima facie, without the sticker, it's an illegal machine. And then there's sure. no question. It's now, a there was a Chuck, e, a Chuck E. Cheese that had a um, legitimate skee ball uh, redemption game. We could sticker that and say, this is a legitimate skee ball redemption game, and it's approved by the Gaming Control Board as, as that. Anything short of that, though, that would never get a sticker and it would be prima facie uh, evidence for local law enforcement. Just write a ticket and say, get that out of here. It's illegal. It doesn't have the sticker. So it would drive that, not that I want to take on any more responsibility, but it would drive that industry to have to come to us for approval, which they wouldn't get. That, and that makes, would make it easier for everybody to see. A lot of sense. Um, I had spoken at that webinar that we were both involved in about a murder that was related to an illegal machine in uh, upstate Pennsylvania, Hazleton. Uh, there was a video poker machine in a convenience store. Um, a guy played it r repetitively. He played one day came back a few hours later disguised and shot and killed the clerk on duty, stole the payout money that was behind the counter. So uh, while it's mostly not a victimless crime, which, it, you know, in your basic VFW setting, it's usually not a, a victim crime kind of thing. Uh, it can be. Um, have you had any incidents of uh, violence related to machines in Michigan? I'm sure we have, but I don't have any statistics to relate to regarding that. Um, you know, some of these places do have other crimes that go on there. If local law enforcement can't relate it back to a machine, we haven't heard about it. We have had crimes at our charity gaming sites. We've had robberies, armed robberies there. Uh, okay. you know, and uh, you know, we had some guys shoot a shotgun in the air and they happened to rob right up in Flint to steal everybody's money. And uh, they happen to be the chief of police up there having to be playing the card game and shot the guy. So we've had, we've had uh, some crime associated with those. Um, but law enforcement has been really good. Once they know it's illegal, they'll just run with some of these, right? They'll harass that party store until they get the machines out themselves, you know? So that's been good for us. That education of law enforcement was, was really helpful. Um, the, the cease and desist letters were helpful. But I mean, in no means that we solved the, solved the problem. We're now moving into, we're just doing the strip mall stuff now. We're now going to start moving into some of the fraternal halls and try and get like the VFW and those places aware of what they've got. So, but that being said, I hate to cut you short, but I do got to run. Well, well, Rick Calm, Executive Director of the Michigan Game Control Board, thanks for your time. Kevin's got a lot of coverage on this at playpa.com. I've got an interview with Rick that we're going to be writing up as well. Thanks for your time today, Rick. No problem, you guys. You take care. Anything else you need, get a hold of us, okay? Thanks, Director. Have a good one.